Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Zach Shiner, who's Chair of the Emergency Medicine at Sharp Memorial Hospital here in San Diego. Today's lecture is entitled eCPR in San Diego. We are so fortunate to host Dr. Shiner on this important topic as he actually helped pioneer extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation or eCPR for patients in cardiac arrest. He's published extensively in the field of resuscitation and is co-editor of the recently released ELSO eCPR textbook. He's been a leader in promoting and training emergency physicians to initiate ECMO in the emergency department, which makes it possible for patients in cardiac arrest to be pl placed on pump in a timely manner, which in turn saves lives. He also hosts the ED ECMO podcast, co-chairs the emergency ECMO program, directs the ECMO Reboa conference, uh, reanimate, and speaks literally around the world on this subject. We are thrilled that Dr. Shiner is joining us today to provide an update on the latest evidence for eCPR. We appreciate his unwavering advocacy and support in initiating an eCPR program right here in the County of San Diego. Thank you so much and over to you, Zach. Oh, thank you, Christy, so much. I mean, I, I will tell you, I am honored to be able to give this talk today. This is a topic that is so exciting. And this project that we have we have now initiated is is just um, it's just unbelievable in my mind. So I would actually just like to start with a huge thank you to all the EMS agencies, all the fire agencies, to you, Christy, uh, to Saul, for all the people that were involved in this. This is just such a group effort, and um, I am thrilled to be just a small part of it. So today we're going to talk about uh, eCPR. eCPR is ECMO for cardiac arrest. We'll get a little bit into that more, but I want to start off with a, just sort of a, a framework for today. I think I have about 25 minutes maybe of, of initial uh, slides here to talk with you about, and then I'd like to have a little bit of discussion because I think there'll probably be some things that we want to discuss out of this, and then I have a couple slides at the end just to, just to kind of take us home with some more informational things. So uh, to start, I want to give you a graph. I want you to see this graph. And this is from Minnesota. This is a randomized controlled trial that sh looked at these refractory cardiac arrests. So arrests that failed their initial resuscitation, failed their initial defibrillation, and looked at randomizing them to get the traditional ACLS therapy of epinephrine and intubation and all this or to go on and get eCPR. And in this trial, after these refractory arrests, this is a prolonged downtime, not a single patient in the traditional ACLS arm had long-term survival. And in the arm that got eCPR, 43% of the patients walked out of the hospital neurologically intact. 43%, absolute mortality reduction of 43%. Now that, that number is a little bit hard to just kind of wrap your arms around, but you just look at a graph like this. But I want you to just think about, is there anything, is there anything in all of medicine that we do that can provide a 43% reduction in absolute mortality? And there just really isn't. It's hard to actually even look at um, anything in all of medicine that could provide that kind of benefit. And when we look kind of at the, the, the volume of patients with this as well, I think it's good to kind of wrap your arms around that as well. So something that all, everybody on this call would appreciate or, and advocate for and say this is a very useful thing that we do in San Diego is cath lab for STEMI. And so when we just kind of look at some paper math and we or napkin math and we look at, well, how many patients do we save having cardiologists on call 24 seven, having cath lab teams available, having all of these things available uh, with the benefit of versus the traditional therapy before, prior to this, which would have been thrombolytics. We save around 80 patients. And this is in an ideal system. This is if we capture every STEMI and of course we don't. And, and, um, and so we're gonna do this same sort of uh, thing with eCPR. So when we look at that 
patient population, when we look at the cardiac arrest patient population that could be saved with a program like this, like they do in Minneapolis, we save around 77 patients. So these are numbers. These are just ideas, things to kind of wrap your arms around and say, okay, what is the, the burden of disease and what kind of benefit would a program like this entail? But I'll tell you what really changes me and what changed me uh, to, to kind of get advocated into or advocacy into this department was these people. And these are some of our survivors from Sharp Memorial. Young girl, 21 year old, cardiac arrest from her potassium was greater than 10. She's now married, she has two kids. I got to go to the graduation of the daughter of this uh, young man that we, we saved. She's off to Cornell, just amazing stories. Conrad saved from a, a peanut allergy. Maya Uli, who was one of our own OBGYNs, undiagnosed pheochromocytoma, cardiac arrest, put her on ECMO. She walked out of hospital. And probably the most amazing part of that story is that she went on and went back to work and delivered the child of the doctor that saved her. Crazy stories that we have. Diane McGrogan, one of our own social workers that we saved. These stories are, are, are just unbelievable when you experience them. Patients that almost for sure would have been dead and now are back being highly effective in society. All over the world, we see aspects of this as well. I actually just got back two days ago from Paris where I taught at their ECPR course. And in Paris, they do pre-hospital ECMO. Different ways around the world, strategies to try and get this technology into the uh, patients that need it as quickly as humanly possible. In Minnesota, they've gone on from their uh, from that uh, randomized controlled trial to have now this $1.7 million cardiac cath lab in a truck where they are expanding the uh, ways that they can take ECPR out into the field. In Netherlands, they now have 100% of their population that can receive ECPR via a helicopter system where they can take uh, pre-hospital physicians to the field. So all around the world, this is happening. And one of the unique things even here in the US in systems of care that, that maybe don't have all this kind of money. And this is one of the things we need to talk about because San Diego does have some unique opportunities here. In Albuquerque, they have organized a pre-hospital ECMO system. And for all of you EMS folks on the call, I want you to look right here. This is a medic turning the crank on this patient. He is literally providing flow to this patient with his biceps. So not ideal, but hey, systems of care, people are being, uh, they're thinking of different ways how they can get this technology into the hands. And probably the most important study that just came out a couple of weeks ago are our colleagues just north of us. Los Angeles published their first, their first uh, data set from their ECPR out of hospital program. And their numbers, this is, they're very similar to what we're trying to do. They have three different hospitals. They're taking patients to them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what their data means to us. But all around the world, ECPR centers are being organized and structured in different ways, trying to figure out how do we do this best. All right. So in order to look at this, we kind of need to know some numbers. We need to know about cardiac arrest. I know you, um, many of you on the call understand this, but the idea here is that we need to understand what the expected survival of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. CARES data says that, you know, in the state of California, pretty similar to the nation, around 12, 12 and a half percent of patients survive neurologically intact from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It's pretty bad. Just over one in 10 patients, we actually get back with all of our EMS systems, with all these interventions that we try and do to improve out of hospital cardiac arrest. What can we do better? And so when we look at some of these VF patients, we also know that as that time from defibrillation, that time that you get that, that first shock in, that is directly related to their mortality. And so if you want to look at an invention that you could compare to maybe the efficacy of ECPR, you could say, if you can defibrillate in the first two minutes of their cardiac arrest, you can get just below a 50% uh, survival long-term. But one of the things that is important to this graph is also you need to appreciate is just how this asymptotically falls off. And this is important for when we want to transport these patients. So if you look at this at around five minutes, about 50% of the survivors that you're going to get, you've already got. 
So at five minutes, this is really short after their cardiac arrest. And by 15 minutes, maybe a little bit later in some of these studies, 20 minutes, 90% of the patients that you're going to get return of spontaneous circulation, that you're going to get back, you've already gotten. So what do we do with these prolonged arrests and what's their mortality like? And it doesn't matter what rhythm you started with. When you start getting out into the 40, 50 minute range, they're all dead. They're all dead. And so do we have an intervention that can do this? Well, Minnesota says yes. And many hospitals around the world say yes. Many cities say yes. And potentially at a survival rate that's, that's much, much better. All right, so let's talk about this process. A lot of times when we hear eCPR, when we talk about ECMO, we think about these cannulas, we think about putting these in. Honestly, this is only a small fraction. If we think about outside the, the body, we think about the oxygenator and the pump. And this is where a lot of the focus uh, goes on to this initiation phase of ECMO. And I would say that this represents only a very small fraction of what makes an eCPR program successful. And in fact, what I would say is just like the chain of survival that we have for every other ACLS algorithm, ECMO is just one piece. It's an important piece, but all of these pieces are dramatically important for us to, do, to be able to have a successful eCPR program. So let's look at this, because this is something that we can do. This, does not, this is not a unilateral effort. This is something that requires everyone to be involved everyone to have high quality interventions, high quality therapy in order for us to provide this. So to say how we can do this, I'm gonna start, take a little step back and I'm gonna focus on what we've already done. What have we already accomplished in San Diego? Cause this is what makes our city unique. And it makes us have some unique advantages that many places in the world do not have. So first thing at Sharp Memorial, 12 years ago, Ralph Berry walks in, changed my life forever. He, um, 59 minutes of cardiac arrest out of hospital CPR, thought for sure he was dead. Somehow we've got him on ECMO and he woke up in the ICU three hours later and walked out of the hospital neurologically intact nine days later. This was a paradigm shift. How could someone survive after 60 minutes of chest compressions? And now we see it all the time. In our studies, we showed that when we had these eCPR patients compared to eligible patients that would be similar in nature that we showed improved outcomes. We also showed that this could be done with emergency physicians, that emergency physicians who were there in the moment, ready to go, could cannulate and put these patients on ECMO. We also showed that the survivorship, that we were not bogging down our ICUs with these patients, that the vast majority of the patients that died, died within that first day. And that once we gave them a little bit of time, that the survivorship was quite high. Now, this graph is actually a double-edged sword. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm a little dismayed by this because it does speak to something else. And that is that early on in our program, we neuroprognosticated patients way too early. We said they were dead when they weren't. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about how that's going to be an important part of our program as we move forward. For us, this moved into a lot of different phases, podcasts, and we started training people, putting on courses, and we trained patients. Uh, we've trained the trainers all over the world. We have started ECMO programs on six continents and, and had uh, so many amazing outcomes. But one of the most uh, precious things to me from all this is the stuff that we did right here in San Diego. And Scripps La Jolla, massive kudos to them. Massive kudos to Sean Evans over there where they trained all of their docs and they made this a real part of their ER several years ago. And now we learn from scripts. Like we can collaborate back and forth. We learn about process improvements that they're doing. They learn about process improvements that we're doing. And they have just taken this idea of eCPR all the way. This last year, they had 20 patients, they had six survivors, 30% survivorship. Now, again, remember, expected survivorship in these patients is less than 1%. This is a dramatic improvement. One of the amazing stories that's come out of Scripps La Jolla is we trained their docs on a Thursday and Friday, and on Saturday morning, one of their docs cannulated a patient right there in their hospital. Amazing stories. Sharp Grossmont, 
unbelievable. We trained them just a year ago right now, and they have gone from a, a place that has not had uh, great use of ECMO, not great use, not any use of eCPR, and they have now taken this on full bore. And in this last year, they put 16 people on ECMO. Actually, this is just since December data, 25% neurologically intact survivorship. Again, this is quite amazing. So what does this mean for us? And again, massive shout out to all of the, the people that have involved uh, the EMS agencies and fire agencies in San Diego, we can do something like this where we can start getting these patients because that's our primary problem is we just need to get the patients to the hospital. These, these, these patients that can benefit from the use of ECMO and can we do that in a system of care? And this is what this whole San Diego resuscitation consortium is about. And so when we start looking at this, we need to kind of look at, okay, what are the different areas? And I'm going to tell you, I am fully committed to this. In fact, uh, I'm going to tell you that if you need anything from me, I am happy to give my cell phone. I won't do this because this is going to be pushed on the, uh, on the internet, but EMS, fire departments, base station calls, call me anytime. I'd be happy to troubleshoot issues that we have to try and get this to be a successful program for us in San Diego. The second thing that I want to commit to you is this idea of the upstairs care, because I think this is going to be a, a key component. This graft, I hope I can imprint this graft onto your, into your brain, because it is a paradigm shift. It's something that we're not used to. Just like the 59 minutes of chest compressions, we thought that was non-survivable. The idea that patients are comatose does not mean that they're dead, and we cannot neuroprognosticate these patients too early. If you look at this, now what we're talking about here, these are patients that have already gotten taken, primarily taken off ECMO, but they are comatose in the, in the ICU at 14 days, they still have a 25% survival neurologically intact. This means if you look back at our data from, from CARES and look at our out-of-hospital survivorship at 12.5%, so you're telling me a patient that had a cardiac arrest is in the ICU, is comatose. They have almost twice as much survivorship as that patient that we tried to uh, 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 care for at the beginning. It's true. So we need to rethink this. This is a paradigm shift, and we need to kind of reevaluate uh, neuroprognostication in our ICUs. The second thing that we need is we need to think about our quality, our quality assurance for our ECMO. And so quality control in our program is going to be a must. It's going to be a must. If you look at the inception trial, which is a trial that came out of the Netherlands, a randomized control trial, you can predict what their results are going to be. In fact, on almost every one of these trials and, and case series that we see throughout the world, you can predict what their survival is going to be by their time to cannulation. Now my skill set at uh, Excel is a little off here, so you're gonna have to bear with me. But if you look, arrest to EMS, great, eight minutes. EMS to transport, 13 minutes, great. Transport to ED arrival, 15 minutes, great. They get to the ER and they don't start cannulating for 22 minutes. They're sitting there. Why? Because they have to call the doc in. They have to call the CT surgeon in and the cardiologist in these, in these patients. A couple of anesthesiologists were involved. We can't do that. We can't have the patient just sitting there for 22 minutes. They have to be cannulated immediately. And you see here, even after their start of cannulation, it was still another 16 minutes to cannulation, 38 minutes of arrest time that could have been decreased significantly. And so quality control is a must for us in San Diego. We need to have this time from ED arrival to pump initiation be less in 15 minutes. If your hospital cannot provide this, then we need to greatly, we need to, this just, it's not going to be feasible. And so we, as we need to commit to this as one of the, the foundations of our, of our foundation, of our uh, new program here. Secondly, we need to report complications. We need to be able to, to share outcomes and causes of death so that we do have high quality control on this initiation phase. Okay, that's kind of my bubble. That's Saul and Maya, we have a lot of us, we're gonna be working on this, but what about you? What do we need from you? And what we really need is we need to isolate on these two aspects, because these are so important. And I'm gonna show you some graphs of why these are so important. One is that we need to capture candidates. And this is one of the biggest problems worldwide is that we just don't get the patients to the hospital. 
And so there are a number of factors in this. This is the, the preliminary um, algorithm that we are gonna be using. I'd like to actually discuss this uh, in, the, in the time that we have uh, after this talk. But the idea is that you want good patients. You want uh, 18 to 70 year olds. You want them to have had bystander CPR. You want it to be witnessed. You want an initial shockable rhythm. You wanna be able to transport them safely to the hospital. So we need a um, mechanical chest compression device. And then we want the time frame to be short. In this situation, we've talked about less than 45 minutes. I'm gonna show you some data on why even shorter is better. So how many patients are we talking about? Is this gonna overrun the system? Well, this is our OOTS team data from, from uh, 2021, 179 patients. These are the same types of patients that we're thinking about bystander CPR, VF arrest. If we were to capture every single one of those patients, which there is no way that we're going to do, but if we did, then that would be, and let's say that we have three receiving centers, that would be 60 patients per, more, per hospital per year. If we had more, it would be even less. This is a reasonable amount of patients, five per month. We're not talking about overrunning any hospital with these patients. But capture is a huge problem. And this is one of the things that, that was a big problem with the, with the Los Angeles case series that they just put out. They tried in a lot of ways to capture these patients. This was a sticker that they put on their, their defibrillators so that they could try and get more patients. For you all, this, I will be um, very happy if we can get some, uh, a good percentage of these patients captured. The second thing is we got to get them out of there. We got to get them out of the scene right? This means that they got to get defibrillated twice and they have to get put on mechanical chest compression device and they got to be put in the ambulance in less than 15 minutes. This is a difficult task, but as you're going to see in a second, it's critically important. If there was one graph that I would hope that you all could, could just imprint in your mind, it would be this one right here. So this is Minnesota, the Alps study, Many of you were actually involved in the ALP study. The ALP study is just some comparative data. This is the orange bars here. It showed that as you got your ACLS therapy and you had time of ACLS, your survivorship went down, that's expected. And at the 20 to 30 minute range, we were up at you know 25% down in the 30 minute range or even lower. But what I want you to look at now is the blue bars here. And I was just with Jason Bardos, one of the Minnesota people out in Paris uh, last week. And this has remained true even to today, that if you get put on ECMO in less than 30 minutes at UMN, you have a 100% survivorship. 100%. Patients that most of us would actually pronounce because they are there is no possibility of survivor. They have a hundred percent walking out of the hospital. And you see 75% of that 30 to 39 minute range and 50% at the 40 to 49 minute range. This is how you can predict what any program is gonna have as far as survivorship. And that's not to say at 70 minutes, look at this, we still have 25% survivorship. And this is what you can predict. In fact, in the Los Angeles group, which I'm gonna show their data in a second, they had 27% survivorship. Average time to cannulation, 74 minutes. So if we can push that time down, if we can get them to that even less than 45 minute range, we can have some dramatic improvement in out of hospital cardiac arrest survivorship. Here's the Los Angeles data. Look at this. So EMS, great job. I mean, that 19 minutes of so EMS response time, eight minutes, EMS scene time, 19 minutes, transport time, 16 minutes. So a little bit longer on that EMS time. I'd love it if we could have a little bit lower than that. But here's the crux right down there. Time to arrival to getting put on ECMO, 31 minutes, making the total time 76 minutes. So if we go back to this chart, you look at it, they have 27% survivorship. It makes sense. You can predict what their outcomes are gonna be. So the faster we get these people to the, to the ER, the faster we get them on pump, the, the, the better. Now, one of the things here is also this 31 minute cannulation time. I'm gonna tell you, we can do better. We can do better. If you look at Minnesota, they had a six minute average cannulation time. Six minutes. When I first saw this, I said baloney. There's no way, Jason, Dimitri, you, there's no way you two are putting these patients on in six minutes. They sent me a video back, four minutes and 50 seconds. And I said, how do they do that? And we actually took a lot of things from what they do 
and pulled them, completely plagiarized, pulled them to our program. We started doing them. One of the major interventions that we've done is this idea of a wire assistant and at all of our training courses, this is a key part of it. Having someone that can assist you with the dilators and the wires can decrease your time to cannulation significantly. We need the same level of just perseverating over the minutia, making sure that we can get these cannulation times down to these low levels. All right. So let's wrap this all up. What does success look like for us? And it's really four things. It's four things. It's how long are we on the scene? It's can we capture these patients? It's how long it's going to take us to cannulate them. And then what about our upstairs care? And you can look at each of these different say, uh, places and say, hey, in the Netherlands, in their first study, they just, they had one key part that didn't work. In Los Angeles, they did so many great things uh, and they've had some great outcomes, 27% survivorship. But you know what? We can even do better than they are. We can do better than they are. And I hope that we can even try and strive for Minneapolis where we could get a 43% out of hospital survivorship. I'm gonna tell you just one anecdotal story. This is from, I, uh, I, he said I could share this just out of one of these outside countries that, that we trained just a few days ago. They had their first eCPR patient and they are stoked. They, are, they can't believe it. This patient got taken to the cath lab and woke up after just a, a brief interve intervention with ECMO. Amazing. So final thing here is I want you to realize about how San Diego is actually more than just San Diego that what we're doing right here is actually something that could result in huge change in the world. Right now, we've established in the world that eCPR is effective. We've established that eCPR can save more lives. The one thing that we have not established is can we do this in a financial, financially reasonable way? In Minneapolis, they have massive money, huge grant. $1.7 million truck. They have a cath team that's on 24 seven. Not feasible. It's just not feasible to do that all around the world. Pre-hospital systems are expensive, but what we have in San Diego is we have an army of emergency physicians that are trained and have shown outcomes that are quite good, quite good with eCPR. And so this model, this model of having um, eCPR receiving centers with good pre-hospital care, good post-critical care may be an option that could change the world and offer this therapy to so many more people all over the world. And so with that, I'm going to stop. Like I said, I have a few more slides at the end, but I'd like to just open up to questions and maybe a, a few topics that we could discuss. Thank you very much. That was absolutely outstanding. I've been monitoring the chat and do not see any questions there. I also do not see any hands raised. Anybody have any comments, questions? I'm going to go ahead and put up the algorithm and we can talk about that a little bit. Oh, here we go. Couple questions. Um, Dr. Scott, in any of these studies, did they look at whether or not delaying for intubation or IV placement made a difference? Oh, that's a great question. So I would um, actually, Jason Bartos just had a patient, uh, just had a paper come out. And if you want to look at someone who I am a huge fan of, his name's Jason Bartos, he's out of Minnesota. He, send, he, he does great papers, so much data in there. He just published a paper on use of LMA for these prolonged arrests. So, right, we have lots of data that says, hey, LMA, maybe even a non rebreather is effective in these cardiac arrests. But does that translate to these prolonged arrests? And Jason's a believer that it does not. And in fact, his most recent paper showed that LMA was inferior to intubation on these prolonged arrests. I am in the same ballpark as him. I mean, this is still preliminary data. We need much more data to sort of definitively say this. But for these prolonged arrests, I would advocate for trying to get an ET tube in. Okay, thank you. And Captain Clients uh, asked what treatment on scene would be done, IV, one epi? 
So IV epi, yes. So usual ACLS algorithm. Um, we were talking about two shocks and then uh, transport to the ER. Excellent. And Dr. D'Onofrio asks, what is the next priority cohort after shockable out of hospital cardiac arrest patients? Oh, now you're talking my language. Okay. So <laughs> let, let's just be honest about um, survivorship. Right now we're starting with a patient population that we have very good evidence that it works for. Now it does work for other people as well. It works for PEAs. In fact, PEs, pulmonary emboli, causing PEA arrest. This is a great patient population for eCPR. And this is one that we've had survivorship. Uh, John Marinero out at New Mexico has got a, 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 a um, pretty good data set on their, uh, their advocacy for use of eCPR. Uh, for, they even use actually ECMO for uh, large pulmonary emboli that are not in cardiac arrest. So yes, uh, I will not even, I will not describe my favor for asystole on this call uh, in detail, but there is even some patients in asystole that would benefit from this. Now that is not what we're doing now. That 100%, that is not where we're going with this new protocol change, but just realize that this, there is, this is really an economic question, right? You have survivorship benefit at what, um, what downside, at what um, amount of failure. And in our initial phase here uh, in our program, we'd like to get some good saves. We'd like to establish a program that works. And then, you know, years later, we can start talking about some of these other groups. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I, can I back up to the previous question regarding uh, vascular access and innovation uh, or, or airway? I would, I, I think that the way our resuscitation consortium consensus was that we would favor early transport and efforts at vascular access and establishing the airway be secondary. In other words, you don't have to have an IV, you don't have to have an airway in order to initiate the transport the efforts that those could be undertaken in route uh, or at the facility. Yeah, I, that's a great point, Saul. And I, I, you're right. I missed kind of the, the feeling of that question. Um, it, in these early phases of arrest, yeah, reasonable to just do um, your usual care. Uh, what Jason is really looking at is at that the more prolonged arrest. So after you're in the ER, after you've been uh, taken there, do we then move on to uh, intubation? And the idea would be at that time that we should start advocating for that. I think it's a very good point. And remember all the data that we want to move these patients off scene as quickly as possible. So you want to make sure you're doing adequate CPR and make sure we're ventilating. That doesn't necessarily mean intubating, just ventilating. So good clarification. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Dr. Khan asks, are you aware of any regions using an age younger than 15? I believe that's what LA County is using, although most EMS systems seem to have 18 year old as a minimum age. Yeah, again, this is this is arbitrary stuff. Like we're, um, the cannula size is one of the issues. So once you start getting lower than 14, that becomes a bit of a problem, but we have great saves. In fact, um, New Mexico just had a, a few months ago, I think they actually even published this, uh, a great save on a young um, overdose that's uh, where they put the cannulas in on someone that they were going to, uh, actually the pediatrician, I think already pronounced them. Um, so yes, you can do younger. This is not a therapy that just works on adults. However, for our program, um, the age is going to be 18 to 70. And that's always embarrassing when you pronounce the patient and they live, but not in a bad way. Dr. D'Onofrio states we can cannulate at any age at Children's, so at the Children's Hospital. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Zach, do you want to put the algorithm back up? I know you said you wanted to discuss Yeah, that. well, let's, okay, yeah, let me go back to that. So this is just a, a a little, a little nuance, but I think it's an important nuance. So that third one down, well, first of all, capture, like I said, capturing of patients is going to be such an issue. So in the inception trial, uh, you know, actually let's talk about Los Angeles. So Los Angeles, massive city, you know, millions of people in one year, 
they were able to capture 11 patients. We're talking about UCLA, USC, uh, Cedars. I mean, the, the catchment areas of these hospitals are, are, are huge. They had way more than 11 patients. So our problem, if you were to just predict it, is going to be that we're not going to get enough patients. Okay, so anything that makes the algorithm more complicated is a problem. In New Mexico, I mean, sorry, New Mexico, in Minnesota, they make their algorithm extremely simple. Shockable, can you put them on a mechanical chest compression device? Call us. And so uh, any little thing like this is important, but we just have to realize the nuances of it. And I think my biggest issue here is I would love to change that third one down from uh, pulseless shockable rhythm uh, and two defibrillation attempts to initial shockable rhythm. So they do not need to be shockable after their two defibrillation attempts. We are looking for good protoplasm patients and again, I get some of this is arbitrary, but I think it would be reasonable to just say initial shockable rhythm. So you would still leave it and two defibrillation attempts after the word initial? initial? So the, the confusing thing here is that, um, that they should transport after two defibrillation attempts. The, the inclusion criteria should just be initial shockable rhythm. But I'm also open to other people's thoughts on that. Got it, we'll take that back and look at it. And so some of the other things in here, we're talking about receiving centers 45 minutes. Again, if we, even though that's the, the right wording, the, the, the um, idea would be is that we can get them as fast as possible to the receiving center. Yes, this is something as put it, helping put this together, we struggled with this. And in fact, it's worth pointing out anytime somebody's going to look at this that 45 minutes is not drive time. 45 minutes is time of a rest to ED arrival. That's a different, that's asking any uh, EMS agent to make a calculation based on driving and traffic. And, um, and those are issues. So I, I, I have always struggled with the language of this and I would, um, be happy to be involved with uh, taking it as you take it back, uh, Dr. Koenig. Thank you. Great comments. Uh, Dr. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks. So um, first of all, Zach, as someone who's just kind of followed peripherally what you guys are doing at Sharp Memorial, it's just phenomenal what you and Saul and everybody else are doing. Um, really enviable <clears throat> for the EDs that aren't doing this. Um, I, I've, I've, seen other uh systems and i i think if i remember correctly north carolina comes to mind where um they have these smaller rural outlying eds that actually can initiate putting people on pump and yet the definitive care happens at a tertiary um care facility and so understanding that early on in our program we want to have a solid program um, where we're picking the right patients and have good outcomes and can really demonstrate that we're doing this well, is there forward thinking to say something to the effect of, okay, um, we know that the EMS drive time to a tertiary care facility doing this is going to exceed the 45 minutes. However, we have a hospital that's only, say, 12 minutes away. Let's get them there. Maybe that smaller hospital can get those guys on pump and then we can get them transferred to the tertiary care facility that can provide that definitive upstairs care or that cardiac catheterization or whatever that may be. Well, I, I love your comments, Dr. Scott, because this is, this, is, this is what we are proving. This is what San Diego is gonna prove to the world potentially, is that you don't need to have two cardiologists that drive all around town, or you don't need to have helicopter systems. Um, that potentially this is something that we can train hospitals to do, similar to trauma centers, similar to cath lab, and maybe even, even less than that. So I, I believe that you are spot on in saying that, that this is something that our, our city may end up being able to, to change the world as far as they're thinking on who, how much expertise is needed to have a successful ECPR program. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of similar models. For example, the, the age old question of do you have to have cardiac bypass immediately available in order to do a cath for a STEMI? And if you have a, a system in place where you can stabilize the person in the cath lab and transfer them on that rare occasion they need the cabbage, you know, that's one model, particularly in less resourced um, areas. What's come up for us specific to this program is uh, since at the moment there's no sort of eCPR receiving center uh, regulations at the state level, we're putting it under our STEMI centers as an option for a STEMI center. So the question came up, if the STEMI center is on diversion, if the cath lab's not available, would we still be able to take a patient uh, eligible for eCPR? to that same hospital. So be interested to know your thoughts on that. So I, it's a great question. It's a, a great question. Now, once you get on pump, right, stuff changes. You now have flow. You now have, you now have cerebral flow. You now, have, amazingly enough, you actually have some coronary flow, even with 100% occlusion. How that occurs is beyond me, but, but it, is, it, is, uh, it is quite impressive that you can have now patients on ECMO we have a little bit of time. So if you have a center that is drive time farther, do you have better outcomes versus taking them to the closer eCPR center, putting on ECMO, and then dealing with it later? And my opinion, and I think this would be supported with data, is that you should go to the closest eCPR center regardless of their cath lab capabilities. I'm glad to hear that because that was our thought as well. And also that, you know, we want to be clear if the paramedics uh, have someone who's eligible and they're going to an ECPR center, we want it to basically be always open and not, not have to worry about any kind of diversion, especially in this very time sensitive uh, type of condition. The other thing that we said, and you can see it on the algorithm there, is that once you've made a destination decision, maybe you get ROSC and route, great but keep going to that same hospital. We don't want you turning around every few minutes in these unstable patients who are getting pulses, losing pulses, et cetera. So there's, that's a related issue. We have a question from Dr. Schwartz. Uh, what do you think about pre-hospital cannulation? Um, there are pluses and minuses of it. Uh, I, I've done pre-hospital ECMO in, in Paris. Actually, I, I was on call for, with them the last week. So it is, it is enticing. Um, we are going to see some data uh, that is quite impressive coming out within the next year uh, about the times to cannulation. Now, the current data uh, actually is not great. So in Paris, where traffic is horrible, uh, their cannulation times are still more than 60 minutes on their pre-hospital ECPR centers. So uh, the, the real question is, do you get there faster? Do you get them on pump faster with a pre-hospital system? And the answer is sometimes. In San Diego, we actually could put together a pretty impressive pre-hospital uh, program, but, um, but I think as of right now, what we're doing is a, is a reasonable first step. And we will see some more data that tells us about how efficacious these, these pre-hospital systems are within the next couple of years. And I think the point that you made earlier about um, the, the cadre of skilled and experienced emergency physicians that we have in San Diego is almost unparalleled. And if you look at places like France or Germany, they're using what's called the Franco-German model of EMS, which is a philosophy of bring the hospital to the patient, as opposed to what we do mostly in the US, which is bring the patient to the hospital. So it depends on what system you're, you're working in, but we are not looking at pre-hospital cannulation at this stage of the game and not, not in the near term, I would say either, but definitely something to keep an eye on as things evolve. Any other questions or comments? All right, we have just a couple minutes left. So Christy, want me to just roll through these last slides? Go for it. Okay, so just a couple of things to keep in mind as we go through this. Um, in once they get to the ER, there is some there's some variability in how we want to decide whether they go on pump. Um, and the, the major point here is we want to make sure that these were in fact good candidates. 
the, the medics have an impossible job. I can't even imagine dealing with a cardiac arrest like they do uh, on a recurrent basis, trying to gather this information, trying to figure out what happened. And so some of these patients are going to be taken to the ER and not placed on ECMO. So I just want to be clear in every program throughout the world, this occurs. And so I, I think we should message the medics and say, um, you know, they will have gone through a lot of effort. And so we don't want them to feel like we aren't, um, we aren't living up to what we said we were going to live up to. Some of these patients just aren't going to be candidates once they get to the hospital. Let me just shine a light on that point because that's critically important in terms of speaking to the families of these patients on scene and matching their expectations. We're going to tell them about this new program, but we want to make sure they don't expect that the, their loved one will necessarily get put on ECMO, that it's just a possibility. So be sure, um, and we'll have this you know, spelled out in the training but I think that's a critically important point. I just wanted to highlight it. Thank you. Absolutely. The second thing is I want you to just see this is this is a, a randomized control trial from Prague. And one of the things is you get collateral benefit. And we saw this at Sharp as well. When you start advocating for car patients that previously were thought of as just dead, you start getting better outcomes than the people who don't get ECMO. And so in Prague, one of the main things, they, uh, these randomized control trials are all showing benefit with ECMO, or at least you, some of them are non-statistically significant. But in, in um, Jan's study out here, they had really great outcomes with patients that did not end, end up getting put on ECMO. So we may see some collateral benefits from this as well with our EMS services. Um, this is a little bit more about what we already talked about is we need to have iterative change. We need to realize we're not going to hit the bullseye on our first attempt here. We may have to change a little uh, system here. We may have to, to, um, to think about things a little bit differently as we move through. And Netherlands is the perfect example. I showed you that in an inception trial where they, they had these bad outcomes because they couldn't get um, physicians in fast enough and they couldn't get them put on pump fast enough. What did they do? They went free hospital. And now they're having their, their next trial, on-scene trial, which uh, you know, is going to decrease many of the problems they had in their first trial. So we should be similar in thinking that we need to, we're going to have to have some iterative change. This is a, to speak to the comment about PEA and asystole. As you increase your, your um, in, decrease your inclusion criteria, you're going to have more survivors, but you're going to also have more deaths. And so this is just something that we need to realize when we look at our inclusion criteria, we are designed to have uh, some successful cases early on. And then the last thing here is really about um, how change occurs. And this is a, a story from cath labs where they said, well, we, we looked at cath lab and it turned out it just didn't work for us. And, and this is going to uh, be similar to what we have. There are going to be roadblocks. There are going to be trying times. We've had significant trying times over the course of our last 12 years doing this. You know, we get a save and everybody is, is happy and excited and wow, we can't believe it. Like this is a miracle. And then we get a patient that didn't survive. And then we get another patient that didn't survive. And then we get a third patient that didn't survive. And all of a sudden you don't have those same happy faces. And so I think we should expect that in this program. We should expect that we're going to have some hard times uh, and that we're going to we're going to have to weather some storms. Um, but like I said, I'm super excited. This is one of the things, and I'm not saying I have truth here, but, but this is kind of a general thing. First is ridiculed, violently opposed, and then hopefully when we get to the end of this, we can realize that this is maybe a great thing for San Diegans. And with that, I will stop. Excellent. And the data are very compelling. And again, nothing like seeing that the actual people and success stories. That is absolutely fabulous. Any other last questions or comments before we wrap up? Lots of kudos in the chat. Well, um, I'm going to call just on one of our team, uh, Kirk, to describe a little bit of what we're doing in terms of the all important uh, quality improvement. Go ahead, Kirk. Thank you, Dr. Koenig. Um, thank you for everybody and your attention today. And Dr. Shiner, amazing presentation, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of your support and Dr. Levine, also all of your hard work. It's uh, 
it's it's been a very long journey, longer for others, and I'm I'm glad to support and work with with, with all of these uh, great clinicians on, on getting this started. But I would like to kind of put some information out there for everybody. We are looking to try and get to all of our coordinators, ECMO coordinators, uh, or those who would be responsible uh, at a nursing level uh, for ECPR in the facilities together to kind of put together kind of coordinator group uh, to put. Uh, kind of a little bit more of a face on the process improvement, the QA aspects, all of the kind of the behind the scenes work that really goes into supporting these programs. Um, I do have uh, some contacts uh, with some of the main facilities that have been interested in it, but uh, I will put my email address in the chat. If you uh, would like to, to connect those parties with myself, please send me an email. Uh, but we will be getting that launched pretty soon. It'd be kind of like a model for those who are familiar with our trauma system, uh, how we have a working group with the, the trauma directors. We also have a working group with the trauma medical, uh, trauma program managers. Um, kind of the same kind of structure to kind of get that networking and that sharing of information out in the community. Uh, so once again, thank you for everyone's support. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or hands raised. So with that, I will thank you, Dr. Shiner, so much. It was a fantastic lecture, and we are really, really excited to begin this new program in San Diego as of July 1st. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Thank you.